Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my mid-month December 2022 AM reading update that I'm posting smack dab on the 15th. I'm coming to you after having hoped after my nano vlogging experience that I could be much more regular doing weekly AM reading videos, but I have a pretty good excuse, I think, for dropping that ball relatively quickly, it's because I've been battling flu symptoms this week. <laughs> so things have been a little bit rough, uh, and uh, of course I'm not as far with my reading as I might hope to be. Hopefully as I start to feel better I can really do some marathoning through some of my later books. But I do have a few to share with you right now, and just a quick moment to to do it in because uh, not only am I behind on booktube, there's a plenty of other life stuff I gotta get up and doing today as well. So anyway, here we go. I'm returning to the AM reading videos after my NaNoWriMo sabbatical last month and as such I am starting things out for the first time in a month with uh, the latest short story in this collection of Dorothy Parker's complete short stories. Except that I have been at this project for so long, reading one short story per M reading video for over a year now, that we are finally into her sketches at the very end of the book. So these are some sketches that she wrote uh, for the 1920s Ladies' Home Journal, one of those issues. And she called this her Summer Hotel Anthology, which are character sketches of the types of people who would uh, frequent a 1920s American-centric summer hotel. Uh, these aren't my favorite. They're basically writing exercises. They're, you know, exposition-heavy uh, sketches of uh, characters, <laughs> you know, uh, writing exercises, as you will, except I assume her point here is extreme satire, and I imagine it would have made a bit of a splash with the ladies' home journal uh, community. That's my assumption anyway, as she uh, basically uh, goes through the archetypes of the types of people who would uh, frequent a summer hotel uh, from this time period. It's mostly women, of course. We have, you know, the um, mothers who are being waited on by their daughters, uh, you know, just to, to get some nice summer air. We have the women who, you know, back when they were, you know, teenagers in the 1890s, went on a one-month tour of Europe and now consider themselves to be experts in the subject. We have a woman who prides herself on her frankness, which is basically an excuse to be highly critical of everyone at all times. <laughs> and finally, at the very end, we have the one man who is there regularly rather than, you know, coming up on the weekends and then doing work in the cities. So he, of course, is the life of the party, even though he's relatively ordinary. But, you know, in his sketch, they talk about how the women fawn over his wit and his uh, humor, which is, you know, pretty much non-existent, but, you know, He's a man, so, you know, it is what it is. I can understand the appeal, but uh, yeah, <laughs> speaking from a hundred years later and just reading these sketches, uh, I kind of miss the short stories, but you know, it, it, it's, it, it's good. <laughs> My first official read of December is also a book that's kind of not a traditional book. It's not a traditional memoir anyway. It is uh, Notes on Grief by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, which she published um, a couple of years ago after the death of her father, who he died uh, during COVID, but not of COVID. And anyway, I listened to it on audiobook, which the author read. So this is a very short offering. I think it's 90 pages, about an hour and a half of listening time. So it's these vignettes of experiences uh, of, of her dealing through the grief and how multifaceted those emotions are just, you know, so so complicated in how, you know, they come on to her and uh, how she responds to, you know, uh, what other people tell her. And then it's also uh, juxtaposed with memories of her father that come up as uh, she's dealing with this vast fact, you know, incomprehensibly vast fact that he won't ever be in her physical life again. I mean, she really grabs that, the complexity of this emotion that transcends death in everything. I mean, it's just so impressive what she's able to do with words, even though so much of it is her talking about how words are insignificant. And it gets a lot into the body realities of how grief plays on the body, too. But it's a lot of everything. It kind of flits around. I don't think, uh, I mean, in terms of the emotionality of what she's saying, I don't think it could be much longer than that. You can't really craft that raw emotion into a narrative, 
although she has snippets of, you know, information about her father, which are fascinating and, uh, you know, could certainly make a good story on its own. And she even talks a little bit about the things that she took from his life to influence the novel she's already written. And that is, in fact, a major reason why I decided to read this now is because I'm doing a, or hoping to do, an author backlist uh, project with Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie this month. I, uh, so I started with this uh, memoir of sorts, and then I'm going to get to her two first novels. Uh, so I'm very excited for that. I probably won't be reviewing the books together until January, and I guess I'll try to keep it short for now, my thoughts on them, or maybe not. I'll probably just, maybe I'll ramble as usual. But uh, yeah, that's uh, my big uh, reading plan, one of my big reading plans uh, for the month, uh, and it's underway, I'm, and I'm excited. The next book I finished this month is Klotzvog by Margarita Kemlin, which was translated from the Russian by Lisa C. Hayden. I am late on this book as well. This was the book I chose for my page 112 tag for November, and I meant to read it last month, but then I did some shuffling of my November TBR. I wanted to read uh, or reread uh, a, a book for the His Dark Materials uh, uh, show the final season is airing right now, but anyway, <laughs> that meant I uh, put this book off, uh, you know, a couple of weeks or what have you, and now I finally finished it. Um, anyway, I'll link to my page 112 tag video below, but this book is about uh, Soviet Russia. It follows this highly unlikable uh, main character, Maya, through, uh, it starts when she's about 20 and goes for about 20 years after that. So about her adulthood, and how she lives her life. Uh, she goes through husbands like, you know, yesterday's news. She's highly vain and self-centered as a character goes, but I think some people enjoy the voice of that sort of thing. I enjoy the commentary because, you know, part of it, of course, is she's just an unlikable person, but part of it is that she um, has some trauma in her backstory, and her backstory uh, dovetails into uh, the realities for Jews in Soviet Russia at the time. I mean, one of her formative memories before the story starts is that she and, and her mother were forced to flee their home when the Nazis invaded and her, her father died. Uh, so that's one of the things. And, and from that, not so much because of the Nazis, but because of Soviet uh, propaganda about uh, anti-Semitism, is that she is distancing herself a lot from Judaism. And like, this is a very, I guess, uh, almost stream of consciousness, almost gossipy type story, like how she's just looking back and giving her rambling thoughts on her life. And uh, so one of the things uh, that she's doing is uh, rambling about how her uh, mother uh, raised her son and she was worried that, uh, you know, the boy was getting too into his Jewish heritage, like, which mostly was about understanding any customs or speaking with an accent or that sort of thing. Anything that might give him away in the public sphere as being Jewish. And she does a lot of stuff herself to try to distance from all of the uh, markers of the Jewish nationality, as it's understood, uh, including ultimately moving from Ukraine to Moscow. Um, and then she has a daughter later who goes into the next generation's more violent sort of anti-Semitism of really feeding into the stereotypes, you know, the, oh, they're just, you know, these money-grubbing, you know, uh, uh, outsiders and you can't trust them. And uh, it really is so much about psychology. It's not about hurting others because all of these people are Jews themselves. It's about... Uh, how the system has turned them against themselves, basically. I mean, it's like an insidious form of the big brother is watching. It's not like a huge allegory of, you know, how uh, overbearing and uh, dangerous uh, the Soviet Union and its policies could be. It's much more insidious, I thought. Uh, so I found that fascinating to read, although I don't think the rambly, gossipy style was as much to my liking, to be nitpicky about that. Uh, but yeah, as a cultural and historical uh, vantage point, uh, this was uh, really interesting to read, and I'm glad I read it. The next book I'm almost finished with, have to finish it soon before it's yanked away from me on audio, is The Hundred Thousand Kingdoms by N.K. Jemisin. Uh, this is a book I am reading for the Booktube Spin, which is another of uh, the two uh, TBR games I play. So I'll link to my most recent Booktube Spin video down below. It's a quarterly game that was brought to Booktube by Rick McDonnell, where um, participants create a list of 20 books that they want to read, and then uh, he does a spinny thing, like a digital wheel, and then you read the book on your list, 
corresponding to the number he landed on, or actually last time I did it because I think Rick has left the booktube community, but I really enjoyed this game, so I think I'll keep on playing. Uh, so anyway, I'm near the end of the quarter here, and uh, hopefully in January I will be uh, filming my next booktube spin video, but before that I'll finish uh, The 100,000 Kingdoms by N.K. Jemison, which is the book I landed on. This is a start of a fantasy series for her. Uh, I don't think it's the first book she wrote, or her first foray anyway into the SFF community, but it's, you know, her earlier stuff. Uh, since then, she's written um, the fifth season trilogy, and now she's into the city we became, and uh, it's an uh, offshoot as well, which uh, I think is even uh, more unique storytelling I think she did with those uh, novels, uh, and they really put her on the map. Uh, and, but uh, I feel like uh, The Hundred Thousand Kingdoms is the start to a more traditional, in a lot of ways, uh, fantasy, epic fantasy series in a secondary world taking place with royals in uh, a um, kingdom structure. Uh, uh, she, I think, in inter an interview that uh, was published in The Guardian at the time, I'll link it down below, talked about how Traditional fantasy is about sort of restoring order, like with I don't know, Lord of the Rings, for example, sort of getting rid of Sauron, who was, you know, an, an outsider or somebody who upset the apple cart and bringing things back. Uh, whereas she uh, decided that uh, she wanted to challenge the systems that were in place. Uh, but I feel like a lot of fantasy, uh, if I'm to nitpick, I think a lot of fantasy does that, but maybe she was uh, among the first or certainly among the best. Uh, it's about a young girl who might become the heir to her kingdom uh, and realizes a lot of the pitfalls and the cruelties of her society. And meanwhile, juxtaposed on top of that is uh, the after effects of this uh, godly war, this war between the gods, where one god, uh, the Sky Father, I think, came out triumphant and was able to either kill or imprison all of the other gods who are now serving the people in the city of Sky. Uh, so. There's that big question of whether or not uh, these gods will be, uh, you know, redeemed or not. Although I guess I assume, uh, given uh, Jemison's interview, it's not going to simply be about a return to order. It's going to maybe uh, things will change along the way and we'll be questioning uh, these power systems. Uh, I like uh, the way the narration is, is really interesting because uh, it very, it's really pushing at that fourth wall. Uh, the young woman who, the protagonist who narrates, uh, is definitely talking from the future and sometimes, you know, gives uh, hints of where she, what ultimately happens down the road. Uh, so I, I thought that was interesting. It's leaning almost into the second person narration that Jemison uses uh, in the fifth season and in those books. I, I feel like that's done so deftly and is just so dynamic and out of the ordinary and this feels like almost experimentation that will ultimately move to that point. So I don't know, it's just something I've been thinking about. But anyway, uh, I will report back about the rest of this book, maybe discuss it in more detail in my next AM reading video, which should hopefully be uh, in far less than a week because I got lots of <laughs> videos now I'm trying to rush through this month. <laughs> And on that note, I am a couple of stories into this collection, Scary Old Sex by Arlene Heyman, but maybe I will put this book aside for now and not discuss it at all until the next damn reading video so that hopefully I will keep having new and fresh things to discuss. And that about covers it for me now. Uh, yes, I will link to my uh, TBR games down below if you'd like to find out more. And I will be back on this channel imminently uh, with my page 112 tag now that I've, you know, finished reading my November pick, it's time to move on to December. Uh, and I've in fact already pre-filmed the video because I'm always so excited to make those videos. So now I just need to edit it and get it posted. So hopefully I'll do that soon because yeah, as I've been saying, I am behind on my videoing and I hope to get all of my December videos in in this last half of the month. So stay tuned. So long as my voice holds in. <laughs> Oh boy! And on that note, I guess I will stop talking now and say that I hope you are all enjoying your reading and enjoyed the first half of December Literary Pursuits. Thanks so much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>